I'm a bit puzzled. Um, how much, how much English did Bruce have or not have? And if he really had so little, um, how does he claim to know Ruskin? How, how did he come to know Ruskin? Um, well, he had a better reading knowledge than speaking knowledge, which is common. Um, and um, I, I don't know quite how to answer, except to say that I've, I've like lived that myself and it seems kind of normal to me. That, um, that of course, you have to you know, basically know what the words mean, but there are also dictionaries for that. If you get come across one that you don't know, that is how one learns the language. Um, at least for me, the way I learned the languages that I really do know, like German and French, it's because I wanted to read people that I couldn't read, and so I would, you know, dig in and look up every word in the dictionary, and then. The strange thing always happens where after about page 50, you don't really have to look up the words anymore. And it's not like an author has used all their special words in the first 50 pages and just repeats them. You somehow get into it. You somehow get the melody and, and you know how it works. So that is probably not an answer that will do much to overcome any skepticism that anyone has about how this is possible. but. Um, you know, he, he studied assiduously and um, immersed himself in these works and, um, and had this ability to attune himself to, to what Ruskin was saying. So, um, you know, I, I, don't know if that, I don't know if that's at all convincing. Uh, he surely knew English well enough to read Ruskin, just not well enough to call a taxi. <laughs> no, I mean, so, uh, where, where do you think that the passage that you just read falls along the spectrum of um, Proust's ultimate rejection of Ruskin and his, his sort of beauty as being idolatrous? Um, the passage I just read in, in, his, in, in his definition of beauty begins again. Right, I mean, it's not a coincidence that William Morris says who is, yeah. Um, so, so uh, for those of you less familiar with the background, um, there is this development in, if we, if we look at the content of Proust's thought, um, where Ruskin is at first this great master of his, then there's Whistler, who is very dramatically opposed to Ruskin. And at one point in one of the footnotes, he says, well, Whistler's the opposite. But if you follow the lines far enough out, maybe not all the way to infinity, but far enough out, they'll meet. So he kind of fudges that a little bit. Um, uh, Eric Harkulis, in his, in his foreword to this book, uh, talks about that more than I really get into. Um, so uh, I think that on the level that I was engaging with this work, I was less interested or concerned with the kind of doctrine um, and more with the translation process and the reading process and then also, you know, how the sentences entered into. Uh, so uh, it's, it's clearly true that um, as in kind of all the great uh, artist mentor figures in remembrance of things past, he ends up in a way moving past them um, and disagreeing with them, but not um, disagreeing with them in the sense of thinking that they were worthless or a waste of time or anything like that. There are, in Remembrance of Things Past, the four great artist figures of um, Bergat, the writer, Elster, the painter, Bentoy, the composer, and Burma, the actress. And, um, and they're all composites of various people, but Bergat definitely has some Ruskin uh, in him. There's, there's a real giveaway uh, in Swan's way where, um, where the young narrator discovers Burgot and uh, first of all says that he only really gets into him once he's read the third or fourth book, um, which is what we were just talking about. But then also he gives, uh, he quotes a few of the phrases of Burgot's that, that he loved. Vain dream of life, 
inexhaustible torrent of fair forms, and then this is the real giveaway, moving effigies which ennoble for all time the charming and venerable fronts of our cathedrals. So this is clearly a, a wrestling knot in there. Um, how different is the texture of, of Proust's French when he's translating as opposed to the parts that are purely Proust, like the introduction of the notes? Um, I had to decide when I was doing this uh, where to go on the spectrum of do I back translate Proust's Ruskin into English and like um, do I have notes because you know I had no interest in the translation gotchas of his little mistake but there are places where there's a mistranslation that's substantive and arguably intentional and that he's arguably you know, casting Ruskin in a different light, and so do I talk about that or not? I ended up deciding not, that it would make the book too crazy, and um, I just give Ruskin's English as English. So I haven't studied Proust's, you know, Ruskin sentences, uh, you know, super closely, because I wasn't really doing them in the book. Um, they, uh, they sound like Ruskin, though. I mean, they, he, he did a good job of getting the Ruskin music and the Ruskin kind of grandeur in there. And so um, I guess I kind of think you can judge the answer to your question by comparing Proust in English to Ruskin. In a way, that's the same comparison. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I was thinking, I, 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 I was reading <coughs> Flaubert's translations of the Pope, and they're wonderful, but they don't read like Poe. Mm. He's not trying to, the, the extravagances of Poe's style aren't mirrored in the extravagances of Flaubert's style. I would say that, that Proust's Ruskin reads like Ruskin, but also that Proust's Proust reads like Ruskin in many ways. <laughs> so that doesn't, you know. Uh, yeah. Um, when you wrote Ruskin, you wrote about the influence of the mother. Start this, let's give you something to do. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of lost and I can kind of watch over you. How much uh, was she involved? She, was, she, was, she, was, she, was, she was. Uh, She did. Marie Nordlinger is the, the friend who uh, was more involved. Um, she was act Her hometown is actually the place where Ruskin gave the lectures of Sesame and Lilies, which Truce was delighted to find out. Um, and he uh, offered to you know, pay her half the royalties and put her on the title page, and she said no. Um, there's a wonderful uh, passage that I include in the book as one of the little snippets where he's in St. Mark's in Venice reading Ruskin and has this sort of meta recursive moment where it's all the same thing. Um, in real life, he was there with Marie Nordlinger and she was reading it to him. Um, and Tadier says a little wickedly that he was transported, but by the text, not by her. Um, so, uh, so his 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 mother was involved, especially in the first one, and, and Norlinger was involved, especially in the second one. Um, and um, I, I I don't know if you're asking about like the family relations in terms of his mom giving him the project, but in terms of the work on the book. Um, my understanding is that, you know, he got the first draft and then did years of hundreds and hundreds of changes a page and did all his research and notes and revising and tinkering and, and that uh, the first draft was helpful in the way that bilingual dictionaries are helpful or native speaker informants are helpful when you're doing a translation. Um, uh, I mean, I could say a, a little more about, um, are, we, are we finishing? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I could say a little more about the project I did that was probably closest to this, which, which again, well, there's probably a 50-50 chance that it'll make Proust's method seem more reasonable or just make me seem less reliable, but um, <laughs> the reason I have translated a Norwegian writer is because I was sent a, uh, Norwegian novel that had been translated into German, 
because the Germans translate everything. Um, so an American publisher sent me the German translation to do a reader's report and say, is this a good book? Should we publish it in English? And so I read the book in German. I said, it's a wonderful book. You definitely should do it in English. Uh, as sometimes happens, they said, well, thank you for your report. No, we're not going to do it. Um, but I liked the book enough that I got in touch with a native Norwegian speaker, fluent in English, friend of mine who had studied translation. Um, and so we ended up co-translating that book. And what does that mean? What that means is that she did a first draft from English to Norwegian. And then, uh, nor now, the three things you need to know are Norwegian is quite similar to German, very grammatically simple, not many endings, not many cases. Um, and thirdly, that this particular author has a very stripped down, uh, repetition-driven style. So, uh, so there I am with the English draft, the Norwegian original, which I can read because I know what it says in English, and whenever there was anything I needed to figure out, I had the German translation to kind of translate, which was very bizarre. I mean, I often had the feeling that this was not something I ever thought anyone would ever do. Um, and I thought going into it that I might end up just being a glorified editor who touches it up. Um, in fact, uh, I, I went through eight rounds with her, uh, gave out only because she was sick of it after the fifth, <laughs> but I forced the last three that we needed, and, um, and hundreds of changes a page. Um, one very concrete example is that the same Norwegian word is the only way of saying he sits on the bed, he is sitting on the bed, he's, uh, he's sitting on the bed, he sits, he, I'm sorry, like he lies on the bed, on the bed, on, he, he's lying in the bed, he lies in the bed, you know, all of those things, and this is a sentence that's repeated dozens of times, and so every sentence is a choice, and how do I make that choice? Well, no translator from Norwegian to English has any more information than I have, because there's one grammatical structure there. The choice is about me seeing how the repetition works in the original and how repetition works in English and using my English language writing chops to manage the variation and repetition and tenses and all that kind of stuff. So, so I mean, it's something people do uh, as translators. It, it's one of the big controversies in the translation world. You know, should you get a native speaker of what's called source language, who knows everything but maybe clunks a bit in the target language, or vice versa, and so forth and so on. So, uh, just a just a personal uh, just a personal version of you know I don't claim to know Norwegian, I claim to know Jan Fasa. Like, <laughs> makes sense to me. <laughs> maybe just one more. One more. Um, we first have had anybody to talk to about Ruskin rather than trying to teach about him in the fashion that he read. That's a good question. I mean, I mentioned at the beginning how prominent Ruskin was. There were um, several uh, well-received and influential sort of long essayistic discussions of Ruskin in French giving translations of passages and things like that. So it wasn't some right, right. discovery. I mean, like anyone right else in his circle, in his circle? Or, or, or friends or? I would think yes. Um, I, I don't have at my fingertips like the name of his friend so-and-so who he used to talk about it with. But, um, but Ruskin was, was extremely important and influential and, um, and getting more visible in French, even for his friends who wouldn't have been able to read it in English. Um, one thing you have to remember is that there weren't uh, photographs in art books. So, um, you know, doing these pilgrimages to go to the place, which, which we're so familiar with from Remembrance of Things Past, about going to Venice, going to see the Giotto, going to all these places, um, 
I mean, that was what you had to do to see the work because you couldn't see reproductions of it. This, the technology was just kind of starting around then that, um, that you could get black and white pictures in, in art books, all of which Proust eagerly collected or barred whatever he could get his hands on. So there were a lot of people who would do these Ruskinian pilgrimages to the various cathedrals or to Venice or, to, or whatever. Um, I would say, <laughs> The more I think about it, the more I would feel confident saying, even with no further factual information, that yes, his circle must have, you know, known Ruskin pretty well. Damien, thank you. I hope you'll sign some books. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.